wonderful to see faces that we haven't seen for a while and uh, other faces that we have never seen before. And, but it's good to meet together Amen. and uh, find a unity in the Lord Jesus. I know the seats are a little bit hard, so I'm not going to <laughs> test your patience uh, with a long drawn out story. But I'd like you to um, turn with me if you do have your Bibles and you'd like to have a look to Jude, uh, Exodus chapter 33. Exodus 33. <laughs> going to read verse 13, Exodus 33, verse 13. And this is something that Moses um, expressed. He says, now therefore, he's talking to God, now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way, that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight, and consider that this nation is your people. Show me your way, that I may know you. Show me your way, that I may know you. I really believe, folk, that that is the central burning issue in our hearts as true believers. We're saying to the Lord, Lord, show me your way. If I found grace in your sight, if I found favor, and the scripture says through the gospel, we have found favor, we have found grace, His mercy has been extended to us, we're born again, our sins are washed away. Now the question is, show me your way, show me your way, that I may know you, that I might find grace in your sight, that your favor may be upon me. Now, getting to know the Lord, um, you know, we, as Christians, there are so many um, varieties of Christianity. There are so many different um, interpretations, ideas, and as you meet up with different Christians, you find that they have different views, different ideas, but really when it boils down to it, it, it the whole issue is I need to get to know the Lord. And the reason for meeting together like this is to get to know the Lord, to understand Him. <clears throat> what we do know about God is the fact that He has created everything around about us. And that is a very clear expression of God's ability, His power, His glory. Uh, the scripture says that even His eternal God can be known by the things that He has made. If you take special interest and um, take a good look at creation, it tells you much about the thought that has gone into it, the wonderful design, and that all comes out of the heart of God. But looking at the creation isn't sufficient because God has expressed Himself through His Word. So the Word of God is the expression of God's mind to enable us to understand Him. So He's communicated with us through the Scriptures so that we can get to know God. Unfortunately though, what often happens is that we come to, come to the Scriptures or come to the Bible with our own agenda, with our own needs. And we're trying to find a solution for me. Where is an answer for me? How can my life be improved? How can I find a way around this particular difficulty? So we're... We often approach the scriptures with a very personal uh, burden in, in mind and try to find answers. Now, of course, there are answers in the scriptures. Jesus is the answer. Amen. But, but the Word of God has not been written to give us answers for our individual needs specifically. The scripture has been written so that God may express Himself to us and that we may get to know Him. Um, and... In, in thinking about this particular aspect, we, we know that the Holy Spirit has been sent. And He has come to take the truth of God and to reveal it to us. He'll lead us into all truth. And that's a wonderful thing that God has done. But so often as we read the Scriptures, 
there are ways in which, with our own intellect, we, we endeavor to interpret. We endeavor to understand. And we, we, we come from various angles, depending on who you are, and how much you know about the Bible, and that's how we will try and interpret it. And so you get 101 different interpretations. But of course, there is only one interpretation, and that is the truth which the Holy Spirit leads us into and opens our heart to understand. And as, as I said, in thinking about this concept, and I've, I've shared this a little bit with, uh, with some of you before, but I, um, at one stage, was working with a group of Zulus, and um, we were on the building construction and we were building houses and so on. And um, I was trying to communicate with them, obviously, to tell them what to do. And they spoke Zulu and, and I was English, but I learned enough Zulu to, to communicate with them and to explain what they, were, that, what they had to do. So my Zulu is not particularly good, but I knew enough words to try and explain. Um, and while they were working and I was busy setting out and they were digging, um, I heard them talking about various things. And they were asking questions, particularly about uh, the space shuttle. And I heard in their language they were saying they didn't, they didn't believe that it had happened. And then eventually they asked me. And I suddenly realized now that I had to try and explain to them technical things that I didn't have any Zulu words for. And, and eventually, and I've told this story, which I won't tell again, um, I explained to them how we went to the moon, the rockets went to the moon, but all in this kitchen Zulu, I was explaining to them how we got to the moon. But then another uh, subject that cropped up was heart transplants. <laughs> and, and you know, <clears throat> Zulu, um, the Zulu language is limited when it comes to biological things and technical things. For instance, um, a saddle is an isa, which of course is the Afrikaans word, just turned into Zulu. And soap is isipo, so then again a siap just changed into Zulu. So, so there are not, there are no words for. Uh, for instance, I asked, it, asked someone who knows Zulu very well, I said, what is the Zulu word for gravity? And he thought for a while and he said, e gravity. <laughs> so, so in other words, there, there's a limitation in the language to be able to describe something that requires words that are technical. And I was thinking about that because here is the word of God which has spiritual truths and we don't have English or Afrikaans words to describe many of these spiritual truths. So I'll just give you a brief version of how I explained to these guys the, the heart transplant. I said, corner law law hospital la Town and the Gamkalo Hospital is Kretaskir, Makulu Shed. And I said, Kona lo Dokatela Lapa, lo Gamkaina lo Dokatela Banyard. And uh, I said, lo Kona lo Mutu in a Figile Lapa lo, lo Hospital lo, lo Makulu Shed. And lo Hart Kaina in I Hamagashi. In a Gula Stilik in I Hamagashi. Lo Hart Kaina in Hamba. So, I said, go to the banyard and the don't worry, don't worry. So, look, he's a little hot to win. And there's a fabulous new one. Ah, they said, how? They've been a total new one. Where are they going to get a new one from? So, I said, oh, do in a in a siga lo lo munya moto in a siga in a vula in a kipa lo hot guy paga la palo dish shinga la palo inigo lo inja lo inja in the lo nice 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 
man che lo lo monte na la 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 pe na kono no ha ko tra lo do ko che la banya de na fagi le lo ba pa lo pa pe na ma lo pa lo pa lo pa pe na ha ma ganje 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 and lo ga se ga na na puma and then gana and puma and gana na 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 la 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 i said bye bye lo lo telephone na kala and lo doctor banya de na ba hello and lo telephone na chela ho kono lo text in ni manile and kono lo monyo monto lo kana ga na shaila still go to lo hot ga na single lo new one lo doctor chela banya de chela voice lo voice lo phone so pagile na na for the union da sigile kipile lo new heart pagile la pelo dish lo ne sigile ke jim na lo new heart ningo lo da ko doge chela banya do doge chela banya na faga la pe na chapa lo ma pai pe na bopa zonka lo ma pai and a bar vale na lo tate lo tringa na na bar and then i said then lo doge chela na tate lo 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 dexo ko lo pot lo lo see me mabi faga lo waya faga la pelo plug in a tata lo lo see me in a chela lo no it's okay shine the switch ha no no how in a shine lo ha ka lo ha ka kutu 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 and bye bye see in the morning lo monte na bula lo ice ka na chela ho good morning na amba ka de lo ha ka na lo new one na amba ka so anyway they didn't believe over that i did tell them once in blackford town and there was a heart specialist in the in the congregation um, and he said it was more or less right but but you know um, just trying to to explain something that is technical uh, without the words it's actually very difficult and that's a difficulty that i believe the lord has because we don't have or th- there are no human words to explain deep spiritual truths but god in his genius in that creative genius has written the scriptures in such a way that we can actually by the holy spirit be led into understanding the depths of the spiritual truths surrounding um, the word of god and the lord jesus christ so the revelation of christ comes out of the scripture as the holy spirit unfolds these things to us but it's necessary to have our minds open to the leading of god's spirit and not come with preconceived ideas to understand the scriptures now what i'd like to do is just <clears throat> take you to let's go to i don't want to be too long but if we could just go to ezekiel ezekiel chapter 28 And the reason for going to Ezekiel is this. In Genesis chapters 1, 2 and 3. 1 in chapter 1 we get a a very quick run through of the creation. In chapter 2 we're told that God made man um, and how he did it and he put him in in the garden eastward in Eden. He planted this particular garden and there the man was placed in this this garden. But when you read the Genesis chapter 2 and 3 account of the garden of Eden um because of our human reasoning and because we've not been there uh we can easily just develop a picture of a beautiful garden some beautiful botanic garden and two naked people standing there or sitting there and and that's the picture often times you know in children's bibles you'll just get a picture Adam and Eve and, and these beautiful trees and flowers and and that's it 
But really, what God is communicating, this is, this is the genius of God. The Genesis account is so simple that a child can understand it. But there is such depth in that account that even the greatest brains will not fully understand it. It's so profound. It's so deep. It's so glorious. And, and so as one reads this Genesis account, one's got to allow the Spirit of God to put together the other accounts that are given in the Scriptures to form the fuller picture of what the Garden of Eden was really like. So what I'm going to put to you is this, and then we'll just have a look at the Scriptures to confirm this, is that the garden that God planted eastward in Eden was up upon a mountain. I've mentioned this before in, in other meetings, but I'm just trying to pull all those thoughts together. It was on a mountain. Um, the scripture confirms that in, in this Ezekiel account. But not only do we realize it's on the mountain from the Ezekiel account, but the fact was that there were four rivers that flowed out of Eden. So rivers only flowed down from a mountain. So it was, it was on a mountain. It was a place where God came and He manifested Himself to Adam and Eve. But that's not, you know, when you read that God walked in the cool of the day in, in the garden and called out, Adam, where are you? You know, we, we read that and with human reasoning it just sounds like there's a voice going around and uh, calling out to this man, Adam. But th th there's a far greater situation because... God always used His angels to stand with Him. And so there, there were no doubt angels in the garden as well. And God manifested His presence. Now, um, perhaps just before going to Ezekiel, I'd like to take you to... <clears throat> let's just go to um, Exodus chapter 19. Let's read from verse 9. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with you, and believe you forever. So Moses told the words of the Lord, uh, the words of, of the people to the Lord. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. Let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of the people. He shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its, its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow. So even if a person touched the mountain, no one was to touch that person. They were to stone him to death. Very serious thing. Um, and when the trumpet sounds long, they shall come near the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes, and they said to and he said to the people, Be ready on the third day, do not come near your wives. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning. Um, that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and the sound of the trumpet was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the foot of the mountain, etc., etc. And so one can read on, but I just wanted to read that to, to give the, the indication that the presence of God is no small matter. It was a mighty presence. So much so that the mountain actually trembled and no one was allowed to even touch that mountain. If an animal touched the mountain, they had to put it to death uh, because of the, the righteousness, the power, the, the, um, the absolute presence of God being so frightening. So back there in the garden, when God came in the cool of the day, it was the almighty presence of God with His mighty angels. And 
One may wonder when, um, you know, when Eve saw the serpent, because the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. He came to Eve. And so again, in our minds, we may picture a snake sort of walking on his tail and talking. And I know a donkey did speak, um, and so God can do anything. But quite clearly, when you look at other scriptures relating back and referring back to Genesis, that was not a serpent. It wasn't a snake walking along and talking to Eve. It was an angel, but in the character of a serpent. Um, and Jesus actually refers to that serpent of old, the devil of old, the liar and, and the murderer. So, so when um, Eve turned and saw this angel, it was not a surprising thing. Because there were many angels there in the garden. So let's just go now to this Ezekiel account, chapter 28. And let's read from verse 12. Son of man, he's talking to Ezekiel, take up the lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the Lord God. In the first part of the chapter, he says, take up a lamentation to the prince of Tyre. Now he's saying, take up a lamentation to the king of Tyre. And notice the language now, because it sounds like he's talking to a human being, but actually when you read the language, he's talking to an angel. He says, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. So that's where you were. So he's now helping us to identify what's being spoken about. He was back there in, in Eden, in the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the turquoise, the emerald, the gold, the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes uh, was prepared for you in the day that you were created. So now, there are, uh, you know, they, he describes these stones. In other words, this, this person that has been spoken about glistened and shone with a beauty and with colors and with a radiancy. So he's describing this angel. He says, then he says, you were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walk back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. Holy mountain of God, Garden of Eden. Um, fiery stones. So the Garden of Eden had stones that actually, uh, you know, shone. There was a glory about the Garden of Eden. It was no botanical gardens. There was no ordinary garden. It was a heavenly place on earth. It was God's headquarters on earth with His angels with God Almighty, and Adam and Eve were going to be part of that great and wonderful um, managing, shall we say, entity. And, and that's really what God said to Adam and Eve. You must have dominion over the earth, and you must subdue it, and you must look after it, but obviously being directed from the mountain of God, from this place of great glory. Um, and... <clears throat> You walk back and forth in the midst of the, of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub. So, <clears throat> so this great angel, and you can imagine... This mountain, the Garden of Eden, where these rivers flowed, where the rocks shone, where there was a glory, like on Mount Sinai, of the presence of God, and that's where Adam and Eve actually lived. Amongst the angels, in the presence of God, uh, able to communicate with God. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful, really. Um, but this angel, when he saw Adam and Eve, and saw the dominion that they were given, somehow he was lifted up in his own heart, and he sinned. Although he was perfect in beauty, perfect in wisdom in the day that he was created, he now turns against God, and, and then subtly, 
he tempts Eve and Adam and they fall. But now God says, I'm going to throw you out of the mountain of God. So he has cast out this anointed cherub that covereth. But then later on in chapter 3, of course, in Genesis, we read how that Adam and Eve were also then cast out. Now, keep that in mind. And let's just go back. Uh, still in Ezekiel 20, 28, but now let's go back to the beginning, to verse 1. Chapter 28, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, remember the king of Tyre we've spoken about, now the prince of Tyre, thus says the Lord God, because your heart is lifted up, and you say, I am a God, so now this, this is a human being, the king of, uh, he's the king of Tyre actually, but he's called the prince of Tyre, simply because behind him, manipulating him, was the anointed cherub, the cover, the king of Tyre. The king of Tyre was actually the devil. And the devil then was manipulating this man, and the same spirit that was in the devil is found in this man. So he says, you say, I am a god. And that's what the devil was saying, I'm going to be like God. And so that he was saying, I am a God. I sit in the seat of the gods. So there's a place where the, the angelic powers come together under the direction of God Almighty. And this man was saying, I can sit amongst them. I'm like a God. I can sit amongst them. Um, and he says, in the midst of the seas. Now seas, not necessarily water, but people. In the midst of the people. Um, yet you are a man and not a God. Though you set your heart as the heart of a God. Behold, you are, you are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that can be hidden from you. So he was obviously a very wise man. And he obviously got his secrets from a spiritual source. And we know the source because verse 12 tells us. The devil was imparting wisdom to this man. Because the devil himself was perfect in wisdom. So now he's imparting the wisdom to this man. And the man is so puffed up that he thinks he's a god. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? With your wisdom and your understanding, you have gained riches for yourself. And gathered gold and silver into your treasuries. By your great wisdom in trade, you have increased your riches. And your heart is lifted up because of your riches. Therefore, thus says the Lord God. Because you have set your heart as the heart of a God, behold, therefore, I will bring strangers against you, the most terrible of nations, and they will draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor and shall throw you down into the pit and you shall die the death of the slain in the midst of the seas. So God is pronouncing this man is going to go down. He's lifting himself up like God. He says, I can sit in the seat of the gods. And, uh, and you're going to be cast down. Now, keeping all of that in mind, let us just go to Genesis chapter 11. And you find this right through Genesis, that in, in Genesis you get... The very simple account, it's, it's expressed so simply that anyone can understand it. But as one looks further into the scriptures and finds the references to these things, the whole picture becomes much deeper, much more involved. So we know the story in uh, Genesis 11, it's about the Tower of Babel. Um, <clears throat> and let's just read very quickly. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass that they journeyed from the east, and they found the plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there, and then, and they said one to another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. Um, they had brick for stone, and they had ash felt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. 
Come, let us go down there and confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth, and they ceased building the city. Now it seems like a fairly um, innocent structure that they are building. But when you take into account many of the other scriptures that we find, that we probably won't have time to delve into now, but I'll touch upon just to, to give you the fuller picture. These people were uniting themselves to, to again ra raise up a ziggurat or a, a tower, a temple, to make contact with the spiritual beings behind, the angelic beings. So they wanted to draw from the angelic beings and unite themselves under these angels, spiritual powers, uh, so that they could then be a united force against God. They didn't want God to interfere with them or to, they just come out of the flood. So now they were banding together to unite themselves to oppose anything that would come from God. If you go to Deuteronomy chapter 32, and there's a, a sneaky little verse that has just popped into this chapter, this verse 8, chapter 32, verse 8. <clears throat> When the Most High divided their inheritance to the nations. Now, when did he do that? The Tower of Babel. So, when the Most High divided their inheritance to the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the children of Israel. But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob is his place, for his inheritance. Now notice this, in, in verse 8, the very last line, it says, according to the number of the children of Israel. Now if you have an ESV version, it says, according to the number of the sons of God. And then the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament, it also says, sons of God. And there are a couple of other ancient writings which uh, translate this as sons of God. Now the reason why sons of God is a better translation is simply because Israel wasn't around at the Tower of Babel. So when God separated the, the, the uh, nations and gave them different languages and apportioned the, the place where they should go, Israel was not there. Israel only came later when he called Abram and Isaac and Jacob and eventually Israel came out. So what it is saying, if we read it like this, when the Most High divided the inheritance to the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the people according to the number of the sons of God. Okay. For the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob is his place, for his inheritance. So in other words, God disinherited the nations at the Tower of Babel. All of them. And he apportioned them to different angels. But later called Abraham, made a covenant with him, and out of Abraham came Jacob, the children of Israel, and he said, the children of Israel, they are my, my nation, my portion. The other nations are disinherit, and I put them under angels. Now, notice this. If we go to Psalm 82. With the blessings fall. Mm. Psalm 82. Okay. God, so it says, God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. So, if you again look at the original, I just checked it. It's Elohim, God. And then he, st he stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the Elohim, the gods. So in other words, he's calling these spiritual beings gods. Okay? And how long will you... He's saying to them, How long will you judge un unjustly? Show partiality to the wicked? 
defend the poor and fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and needy, deliver the poor and needy. Now remember, remember the prince of Tyre said, I will sit in the seat of the gods. So here is in, in this psalm, the seat of the gods. God had called these angels together to give an account of what they were doing because he had appointed them over the nations. Now he was questioning them. And he was saying, why are you doing these things unjustly? Why don't you defend the poor and the fatherless? Do justice to the afflicted and the needy. Deliver the poor and the needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are unstable. I said, you are gods, and all of you are the children of the Most High. He's talking to these, these angels. But you shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes. Then the last uh, verse of this says, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all nations. Amen. Now, although God had disinherited the nations, place angels over them in the end through the covenant that he made to Abraham he plans to gather the nations back to himself through Christ because that's the, that's the promise that is the power of the covenant of Abraham the blessing of Abraham now comes upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ so when one takes this song and also in the book of Daniel you'll recall that there are various times when um, Daniel was waiting for an answer and Gabriel the angel was sent to give him an answer but he couldn't get to Daniel because he was prevented and the scripture says he was prevented by the prince of Grisha and the prince of Persia and they obviously were angelic beings because Michael had to come and help Michael is also an angel so we get a little bit of an insight into these angelic activities behind the scenes, but they're over nations. So, so what one finds is that as you start to look at the simple story, but then add to it the, the fuller story that is given to us in other parts of Scripture, and allow the Spirit of God to put this all together, you suddenly find that we, we are really... Um, there are nations and we're part of the nation South Africa and you can be quite sure there is a dark angel over South Africa as there is over every other nation other than Israel. Right. Michael is over Israel. Um, and God is preserving Israel but he's sending the gospel into every nation so that we can respond to the gospel and then be grafted in to God's wonderful people and to become part of the ruling party. As Jesus, uh, at least as Peter writes, and he says, we are a holy nation, a royal priesthood. And that's what the Lord is calling us to. Now, um, it's amazing how the scripture does pull the curtain aside just for a moment for us to get a glimpse into these eternal things. There's another portion, if we could just have a look in 2 Kings chapter 6. Kings chapter 6. And there was a, a problem here with the word of knowledge. Because Elisha kept getting a word of knowledge. And he was hearing what the Syrian king was saying in his bedroom. <laughs> so whenever he, the Syrian king planned anything, um, and he was going to catch uh, Israel out, Suddenly he found that they knew all about it. And so he called his people together and he said, there's a spy amongst us. And so one of, the, one of his men said, no, it's not a spy. It's that man Elisha. He can hear what you're saying in your bedroom. <laughs> so he took a huge army and he went to go and get Elisha. And so he arrives. <clears throat> and it's just... Verse 11. Chapter 6, verse 11. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet, who is in Israel. 
tells the king of, of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. So he said, go and see where he is, that I may send and get him. And it was told him, saying, surely he is in Dothan. Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and, surround, uh, and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God rose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots, and his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So, very frightening, this whole army was surrounding, and they'd obviously come to get Elisha. He says, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So, all the time, Elisha knew about this, there were angelic forces, fiery chariots, thousands of them covering the hillside. But this servant needed his eyes open just to behold it. You know, folks, we need our eyes open. Not necessary to see angels, but to see the Word of God. To see the power of God. To see and to understand, to grasp the things of God. The deeper things of God. Because that's really what the Lord is wanting to reveal through His Word. As Moses prayed and, and said to the Lord, Oh, that I may know you. I want to know you. I want to know who you are. And that's really what we're desiring. Lord, that we may know you. That we may know your ways. Show me your ways, Lord. That we may know you. Um, <clears throat> so let's just go back now. I'm nearly, nearly done. But let's just go back to Exodus 33. In verse... 18. So he said, show me your ways that I may know you. And in verse 18, Moses got even bolder. And he said, please show me your glory. Please show me your glory. Then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I'll proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I'll be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion but he said, You cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, Here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. So it shall be, while my glory passes by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. And then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. So no one, Jesus confirmed in the New Testament, no one has seen God at any time. Obviously referring to God the Father. But people had seen Jesus, even in the Old Testament. And then He came in the New Testament in human form. Um, let's just keep this in mind and go to Exodus 24. Verse, verse 9. So God called Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel. Verse 9. And they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone. And it was like the very heavens in its clarity. But the nobles of the children of Israel did, did not lay, lay his hand. Sorry. But on the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hand. So they saw God and they ate and drank. Now, just consider this. <clears throat> Getting back to the Garden of Eden. The presence of God, the mighty angels, um, Adam and Eve, and had they not sinned, they would have been in the presence of God like Moses, and they would have been able to see God, hear His instructions, be filled with His glory, and do His bidding, and do His will. But man had sinned. And so now here is God, once again coming down on a mountain, to meet with mankind. And so He, he calls for Moses, 
Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders, and they come before the Lord, and they see God, and they see the sapphire, and the glory, and the wonder of it, but they're obviously not seeing God the Father, which Moses later saw, or he only saw the, the back part of God, but they must have seen Jesus Christ, who is God, and, and, and all His glory, and there He was, the God of Israel, the Lord Jesus Christ, um, in, in His power and glory. Now, let's just go now to the New Testament to conclude this. <clears throat> and we go to Ephesians chapter 3. <clears throat> chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 1. Paul writing, he says... For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given to me for you. Now listen carefully to that. So here is a man who says, I want you to listen carefully to this, because there's a dispensation that the grace of God has given to me, Paul, for you. And he says this is what it is. If indeed you've heard of this dispensation of the grace of God which is given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge and the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles, you and me, should be fellow heirs, of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effectual working of his power. To me, who am less than the least of all saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So that same glorious person that Nadab, Abihu, Aaron, and Moses and the 70 elders saw on the mountain, Paul has declared to us the same one, Jesus Christ. The, he, the revelation of Christ. And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery. So through the preaching of the gospel, we have, we have been called back into fellowship with God, the Almighty God. Okay? Which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. To the intent that now... The manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. So these angels that sit upon thrones governing over various nations, God has called out a people out of those various nations, Gentiles, revealed and given the revelation of Jesus Christ to us, told us who Jesus is, He's not only the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, but He's also the King of Kings. He's also the one that will rule over every nation. And you know, Jesus said, Fear not, I've overcome the world. So we are ascribing greatness, honor and glory to Jesus Christ, who is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And how did we come to know that? By the revelation of the Spirit of God. Through the Gospel. Through Jesus Christ. So... Like Aaron, Moses, Nadab, Abihu, the 70 elders who have been called into the presence of God, we have been called into the presence of God to have fellowship with Him, to take counsel from Him, to get to know His Word. So that to the intent unto principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known the manifold wisdom of God by the church. So God is revealing His manifold wisdom to us. So that we may stand in these things against principalities and powers. And then finally, chapter 6 of the same book, Ephesians. <clears throat> Verse 11, well-known passage. Put on the whole armour of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The same one who met Eve on the mountain of God in Eden. 
is the same one now. He says, resist it. Stand. Stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. These angels, they've got authority and power over the nations. They're manipulating, they're driving, they're planning, they're, um, they're against God. But we've got a power greater than theirs. We can stand against them. We, we're able to be protected from them. Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, three times he says that, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you, you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So God, the Lord, has equipped us with every spiritual weapon and armory to protect us against principalities and powers. So, in fact, may I say in, in closing, our walk is a spiritual walk. Amen. And, and God the Father is seeking such who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. Amen. We need to have a spirit that is cleansed from sin, washed and pure, entering in to have fellowship with God the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ, that we may walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lusts of the flesh, but to walk in this glorious revelation for God who commanded the light to shine has shone into our hearts to bring the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ into our hearts that we may have a, a knowledge of Jesus and when Moses said show me your glory God has shown us Jesus Christ who is his glory and he is ours and we can hold fast to him and we can know him and we can worship him and serve him and be in fellowship with him Amen. Amen. Amen.